This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hello and welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Sue McDougall and I'm so excited to be back with you to share Monday, just an hour or two. Uh, well, depends how many questions you've got. Talking all things gardening, isn't it just amazing? Around, well, Perth has really been hit with winter weather. Now, I know for everyone who lives on the West Coast, that's not unusual. You've had lots of cold weather, but really winter has set in on this West Coast. So some fantastic rain. And I must say, and I always say it, autumn is my very favourite time of the year. There's just this sense of anticipation in the air. And there's so much to do at this time of the year, which means it makes spring gardening so much easier. We'll be talking camellias, we'll be talking some native plants, we've got citrus, we've got all your gardening questions as well. We're streaming live today from multiple pages, the Garden Guru's Facebook page, the Love the Garden Facebook, the Garden Express Facebook, and our own YouTube channel. So welcome, welcome to Garden Gurus Live. Don't forget to add your questions in the comment section. And if you do that, you have a chance to win either a packet of seeds today, or you might be the lucky one that gets the Mr. Fothergill's wooden dibbler. Now these are probably one of the handiest things you can have, no matter what you're planting, whether you're planting bulbs or seeds, or you just want to put some holes in the ground, seedlings works absolutely fantastic. So good luck with that but you've got to be in it to win it. So don't forget to be part of your garden questions right in the comment. We've got our good friend, David Van Berkel, who's sharing the Garden Express offer of the week with you today. Look forward to our chats with David. We always find out much more about the garden than what's actually on offer. Looking forward to that very much. I'll show you some brilliant plants growing in my garden. I'll just show you a few things that might be happening in your garden also, particularly when it comes your citrus tree and we'll check in with Greg Navan. Now what Greg doesn't know about fertilizers, he's a technical um, guru about fertilizer but that runs hand in hand with plants. He's been around for a very long time and really knows his stuff when it comes to fertilizing plants and he's going to tell us about growing camellias. If you've got a beautiful camellia in your garden we'll start the conversation. Have you got a favorite variety? Don't forget to put that in the comment section. I'll be delighted to talk to you about your favourite camellia. They are super tough once they get growing and we'll find out a little bit more about that later on in the show. So in the meantime, let's start off with some amazing questions. We're looking at um, gardening, looking at autumn, things happening at the moment. Now we've got a question from Diane. We have an above ground garden bed in which we plant tomatoes and cucumbers each summer. We don't plant anything in winter. We've been told you shouldn't plant tomatoes in the same place each year because of nematodes. Is this true? Well, it's actually because of lots of things and it's actually not just tomatoes, it's the Solanum family. So, and that includes eggplants, capsicums, it also includes uh, chilies, any of those Solanum family plants. If you can work on a crop rotation, it makes a difference. One thing I can say is that if you have a really healthy, strong, alive soil, you'll find you'll have less chance of problems in the garden than what you would do if you do, don't improve the soil as much. So the secret when it comes to, to gardening is put the effort into the soil, particularly veggie gardening, and you'll get the difference out. But one thing you can do actually through winter is plant some brassica crops. Now brassicas have got very strong natural nematode repellent properties 
and if you can even plant them and then dig them in, you'll find you're improving the soil and putting a cover crop in for the following season. Now, thinking about the weather forecast around, I mentioned this morning, this morning at my place was two degrees. It felt like, no, it was really six, but the official weather forecast said it felt like two. But is that happening where you live? Melbourne's 19 and cloudy, that's positively warm compared to Perth, Perth uh, forecast. A little bit of rain around, but I must always say and point out, wouldn't it be gorgeous if you are in Darwin this week you're lucky enough to head to the warmer climate. So jealous, 32 degrees. But what that does to the garden is you have so many different problems in the garden while the weather's warm. You can still grow corn and tomatoes and all those beautiful warm climate plants, particularly the edibles, will be absolutely thriving. Now, did you happen to see our season finale on the Garden Gurus? It was so much fun putting that together. We would love to hear what you thought of it. Now, it won't be that long. You can find us on Catch Up if you're going to um, miss out on previous episodes. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later on in the show. But put in the comment section if you loved it, did you enjoy it, what was your favourite segment of our season finale? Or what's your favourite segment of the Garden Gurus? Maybe then we can get twist a few people's arms and hopefully add some more favourite segments of yours for the spring series. Now we're heading to Victoria, chrysanthemums. I plotted two chrysanthemums. This is from Jennifer, a white one and a purple one. And within a week, the white one started turning pink and the purple began to freeze, fade, I should say. Any ideas why? Well, the purple one will begin to fade and it's a little bit to do with light, but with white colored flowers at this time of the year, particularly hydrangeas do it and roses do it. When we start to get cold, Sometimes you start to get a little bit of a pink tinge to your plants. So it's a little bit to do with light, but it's also environmental. So you'll find if you can get the light onto them, they're bright. And if you can keep the warmth onto them a little bit, often you'll find you'll get a tinge of pink on some winter plants as well. And roses do it a lot. You'll find late season iceberg roses that are pure white in the spring tend to have a little pink tinge on them throughout the uh, winter, autumn flowers and those winter months, particularly when you have rain also, that tends to happen. Let's head to Perth, back to Perth. My back grass has died due to my dogs urinating on it. What do I do to bring it back to life from BAM? Now BAM, it actually just depends what variety of lawn you've got. And also, is it in full sun? There's a few factors that affect the lawn. And most of the varieties of lawn that are grown in Perth are what we call warm season grasses. And so that's either softleaf buffalo, cockyu cooch, or also the, the some of the fine leaf hybrid cooches. Now the hybrid cooches are really tough. Throughout winter, the growth rate slows down in Perth, but they will still actively grow. You can still get some color onto them. But if the dogs have been urinating on them, a little thing you can do is change the diet of your dogs and that tends to stop the urine being so um, acidic and so damaging to the lawn. But if you've got hardware marks, it is late in the season and it will take a little while to come back. But if you can put a very fine base blend of fertilizer, of soil improver on your lawn, aerate it a little bit, open it up, and then you can start to use a liquid lawn fertilizer on it. And that will just keep it looking gorgeous, hopefully starting to shoot back if we've got some warm weather a little little bit of warmth in the soil temperature which tends to allow them to have a little bit of growth and then as soon as spring starts again light top dressing and it's only five mil over the top of it wash that in well and the lawn will shoot back absolutely beautifully it'll make a huge difference when we're talking lawns is yours looking okay at this time of the year if you live in darwin i'm sure it's absolutely thriving if you're in the cooler parts it tends to yellow off at the moment but the thing we need to look out for are the weeds in the lawn at the moment, particularly where the soil is being compacted. But I know there is one plant that's absolutely looking amazing at the moment. And I know the Sasanqua camellias are just all around the country, uh, stunning and absolutely incredible at the moment. The Japonica camellia is a little bit later on, but one of my very favorite plants, a great standard standby plant, is the camellia. And to tell us a little bit more about it, I'm going to welcome Greg Neighbour. I know we talk to Greg often from Love the Garden. Welcome, Greg. Sue, how are you? Good to speak. Brilliant. 
Brilliant. Now, you, you have caught my heart with this, one of my favourite plants, one of the favourites. When I say structure plants for the garden are the camellia, but I think a little bit of misnomer. People think they're too hard to grow. Uh, indeed. In fact, um, you know, a lot of the the old thoughts uh, travel through even the production nurseries that felt that they needed to be careful with fertilisers with them. But um, the reality is they... Uh, they'll take a, a good feed and, and they'll love it. So um, funnily enough, uh, in fact, my very first job at, in horticulture when I was 13 years old was yeah. a, dis, a disbudder, a flower disbudder at Camellia Grove Nursery. So been involved for a long time. That's interesting you say that because many people set camellia buds or, or look at them, they look like they're going to set buds and then suddenly they send out growth. They're interesting plant they really grow once a year don't they they do and uh you know from their native areas they're uh basically very dry winters and uh and wet summers so as soon as you start upsetting that cycle when they're triggering uh you know their their flower bud initiation during the uh the wetter period if that wet period happens in winter then it, it kind of upsets them and they they're not sure where where they're living today <laughs> Now, disbudding camellias, I think there'd be a lot of our um, viewers and our audience that would think, my goodness, to have that many flowers and have the problem of taking the buds out would be a great problem to have. Well, um, because it was a production nursery and each weekend the flowers would be displayed for, for the customers to come and look at on a, on a water uh, mesh, my, my job was to thin the flowers on the axles so that the bud that did flower had a large flower. So the, uh, by, by pulling a couple of the buds off on the, on the terminal shoot, then the bud that was left would become a nice big, big flower for customers. And do you, think, do you think that it's worth doing that now? So if you're growing them in your home garden, you don't have to go to that effort, do you? Certainly not. Um, I've, got, <laughs> I've got a reticulata that's uh, basically on the corner of the, of the entrance path to my house. And it's, so what I do is I thin just the side to the driveway where people are going to, to walk around. And the reticulatas are, are enormous, they're plate size when you do that. Um, and I don't, don't worry about disbutting the others, of course. <laughs> so we talk about Sasanquas, Japonicas and Reticulata. If you're just a beginner gardener or just starting off gardening, which ones would you recommend to put into a garden depending where you live? Well, the reality um, from a, a screening point of view is the Sasanquas are going to be uh, better at screening. They're, they're thicker, smaller leafed, smaller flowered, but, but very abundant in that. Uh, whereas the Japonicas are more open branched, um, I've got a whole back edge of, uh, of japonica. Um, and it's kind of careful to note that first, if you are needing to prune them to, to bring them back after, you know, if you're heavy pruning, I would prune half of them in, in one year, let that reshoot to, to fill in the, the gap that's there to keep your, your screen up between yourself and the neighbor. And then next year, um, prune the other half. And it's a, it's a good way of kind of retaining your screen without without making it bare. And how important is it to keep the root system cool on camellias? Well, I, I think there's a lot of, again, tolerance in this regard. The, the, the natural environment is quite a, um, a deep humus under, uh, under canopy. So in that deep humus, it's, it's tending to be more of a shaded and cool root run, no, no question, as in most of the rutaceae uh, group, but um, uh, I've found that you know they're pretty tolerant of a lot of pretty harsh and, and nasty situations. Sitting on the on a footpath in the in the, a clay soil with in the full sun, and they still seem to, to to grow and thrive. Yeah, it's actually amazing. They take drought. They do do super well. Now, anyone who's got an amazing camellia, don't forget to put in your comments about how it's looking gorgeous and one maybe your favourite variety. Do you have a favourite, Greg? Uh, Sawada's dream. It's a it's a beautiful okay. blush pink that uh, that flows out, and it's um, yeah, it was always one of my uh, my favourite doubles. Um, another note, just quickly, is that uh, my next door neighbour came in and said, "How is it yours are in full flower and mine hardly have any flower?" He has a gardener, and the gardener pruned them uh, to shape <laughs> after Christmas, 
and of course pruned all the bud off. <laughs> so yeah, we, and actually that's nothing. a good point. That is a good point that you don't prune the flowers. If you do prune them, you will have to um, be aware mm, you might lose some of the flower buds. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, a common thing when late after Christmas, you know, coming to Easter, a lot of people will look to shape them and, and re-hedge or, or whatever. Totally the wrong time to do it. Only do your pruning um, before Christmas, uh, spring after the first flush growth and um, let that flush growth come through uh, without uh, pruning after Christmas. So we talk pruning, we talk feeding. I know you absolute passion about controlled release fertilisers and the future of controlled release fertilisers and what they can do for particularly the slower growing plants like camellias. Uh, absolutely. So, you know, the controlled release fertilisers like Osmocote, of course, have, um, you know, all of the attributes that allow slow and steady feeding. So it means that, that in fact, in, in commercial production, it used to take uh, two and a half to three years to get a, um, a 10 inch tub up to up to size. But if you're using controlled release fertilizer at quite quite reasonable rates, that can come down to, to much shorter growth, growth cycles. Um, the problem when you do grow your plant more quickly though, is that um, we've identified in the past what's called a subclinical calcium deficiency. So it's a calcium deficiency that makes the plant not grow particularly thriftily, but you can't see it. It doesn't have yellow leaves or, or anything else. So when we go in with uh, with controlled leaves or, in fact, you know, in the organic, we don't have a particular one, but this, um, the citrus, for instance, has yeah, all okay. of the attributes necessary for camellia, uh, good magnesium, good iron, um, you know, or everything that's, that's required for, for something like camellia as well. So, yeah, and interesting uh, you say that, um, just while I'm talking about that, you do have um, gardeners who say, oh, I haven't got anything that's specific for camellias, but you say some of those plants, if you think about the plants with similar growth rates and nutrient needs, you can use a, say, a citrus and fruit fertiliser. That's a good quality one. Absolutely. The, the only caution in fertiliser use is really um, phosphorus-sensitive natives. Uh, so, you know, as to not apply phosphorus, whereas the majority of exotics will take anything. These things, these particular um, varieties, let's say, of fertiliser are catering to the very exact needs of, of a, you know, premium uh, growth response. Good iron for obviously citrus and camellia. So your, your leaves are dark green. You know, we put higher phosphorus in rows because that better defines flower colour. Um, you know, there are some attributes that you're looking for. Now, Greg, did you say to your neighbour it's because of the fertiliser you use also, why your plant's got more flowers? <laughs> Tell him some more fertiliser, no. Yeah. <laughs> no I, I said you better, you better send your gardener over for a bit of a, um, a, a camellia education class because he's just <laughs> doing the wrong thing. Yeah, exactly. I'd be a bit stressed if I was that gardener and you were my neighbour. Uh, the technical the technical knowledge you have about fertiliser would make a big difference. So what time of the year do we need to put, uh, need to feed our camellias? So uh, after flowering, uh, late winter, early spring is best. You'll have a good flush of growth then that you can prune against before Christmas. So that really brings on, uh, you know, a massive flower uh, um, for, for next uh, for next winter, etc. So, yep, spring um, spring's a good time, uh, and you'll get flush growth at that point. Oh, I look forward to it very much. Check it out: Osmocote, azaleas, roses, and camellias. And if you don't have that, maybe you can get hold of some um, Scott's citrus and fruit fertilizer as well, professional grade. Yeah. That will make a big difference. But we're talking Osmocote. Osmocote has been a brand that's been around for a long time, and I would say Greg's been involved for that long as well. Greg, thanks for your time this morning. Good to speak to you, Sue. Thank you. Yeah, great. Greg Neighbour from Love the Garden. Let's head back to our questions. Uh, if you've got some, if you've got a favourite camellia, you've heard Greg's favourite camellia, maybe you can put your note down and share the love of the camellia maybe this, this weekend and you can go out and see what's looking gorgeous. From Mahogany Creek, James, can you recommend a grape variety that produces a nice table grape and also nice autumn colour? The leaves are the one I had recently turned brown, which didn't look very attractive. Now, James, I have a little bit of um, inside knowledge, but Mahogany Creek is not very far away 
from my um, my neighbourhood where I live. And this year was particularly tricky as far as autumn goes because of it was quite dry and then we, we just didn't get, it was quite warm, so we just didn't get that beautiful autumn colour and they hang on for a long time. So if they have dropped off, go for some of the old varieties if you don't mind. If you don't mind grapes with seeds, I would um, look at Italia. I love Italia. I love musket grapes. They are just got the absolute best flavour. But if you're looking for a variety that's got no seeds and also hardy, grows strongly and has some beautiful autumn colour, definitely check out Sultana grape. They are fantastic and they're just easy to grow, been around vigorous and been around for a long time. But if you want beautiful autumn colour and just incredible autumn colour that just almost glows, you cannot go past the ornamental grape. Now, this is not going to send out any fruit for you, but the colour of it is just absolutely spectacular. So in Mahogany Creek, if you're in a spot where it's a little bit cool, maybe you could grow an ornamental grape also as a standard. Now, how you would do that is that you train it up on a big uh, stake and then you'd let the branches hang down and it's particularly stunning. Fast growing grapes are underrated, I think, to use for summer shade and winter sun, particularly even if you're shading parts of the garden as well. Enjoy them. Enjoy Mahogany Creek, actually. Beautiful part of the world. Let's head to another gorgeous spot, Belgrave in Victoria. Margaret, my hippiastrum hasn't flowered over the last few years. What am I doing wrong? Now, hippies are interesting because they are a plant, well, they're actually a bulb. They need a dormant time. So over the winter, they need to go dormant. They will then set their flower, their embryo for their flowers, and then send out their flower before they send out their foliage. Margaret, one of the things that you can do with a hippie astrum is at this time of the year, they need, well, a little bit, so in May, they need to be fed and so that then they go into their dormant time so their bulb is big enough to set the embryo for the following season, for their flowering the following season. If you've got a pot and it's jammed, packed, full of bulbs and there's lots of bulbs around it, what you can do is split them up to get some beautiful large bulbs and feed those individually and then that plant is strong enough and mature enough to flower, set that embryo for the following year. That makes a difference. And also bulb fertilizer, after they've finished flowering, while it's foliage on it as well, a complete bulb fertilizer that's going to deliver the nutrients that set that embryo for the following year. I always say the work that you put in for, for bulbs this season, you'll see it next season when it comes to bulbs. So bulbs is fruit, future gardening. You can do the work but you, have, you don't get the benefit for 12 months' time or the next growing season. Hope that helps. Margaret, enjoy them. Hippiastrums, I just like their foliage as well. So, you know, maybe enjoy them as well. To Marika, my citrus trees are going yellow. Is this an iron deficiency or are they just not suited to the area or soil? Must comment to say, please don't forget to put your area in when you send us a comment because then we'll know exactly what's happening. Citrus trees will turn yellow at this time of the year. If you live in very high alkaline soil areas, they'll particularly showing up iron deficiency. And iron deficiency is when we have yellow leaves and green veins. And so often we'll say a complete citrus fertilizer that's got added iron, that'll make a big difference to growing citrus. But also if there's a lot of fruit, and I haven't had a program of regular feeding, I would start, what we do, Marika, is we start or recommend fertilising a citrus tree at the beginning of every month, a little bit regularly, so from August to May regularly, and then I always feed the foliage, particularly if they're growing in a pot. You can imagine how many nutrients it takes out of the tree for it to grow, and you'll find that it just sucks the nutrients out, and so if you can keep regularly feeding them, they they don't take very long to come back looking gorgeous if you're using a foliar fertilizer, soluble foliar fertilizer at the same time. And also, if you've got a lot of fruit, just pluck the fruit out. Um, you heard Greg talking maybe about uh, thinning out the camellia buds. The same thing happens when we're growing citrus. If you can thin them out, you'll get bigger fruit and the same nutrients are spread over half the amount of fruit, but the fruit are double the size. And so hopefully that helps. But start a program of fertilising. You can give them a liquid fertiliser now, but start a program of fertilising at the beginning of, of spring. To Sydney, for, to Janice. Hello, Janice. Can you please give some advice on growing cyclamen? 
is it true that they die after flowering, including the leaves? What's the best way to care for them to ensure they come back? Camellias are a bulb and they're a cool climate bulb. So I'll say if you just have a look underneath the leaves, you'll see where the leaves come out of the bulb and underneath is this just perfectly round little bulb. The foliage, they love the cold. So you put them out at night and when the, the cat comes inside at night, the, put the camellias outside. But you can also grow camellias virtually in a pot on a veranda, on our fresco area, they really, really love winter. Over summer, yes, they will die back and they get very stretched as the weather warms up. And you'll find that over winter, they'll just, sorry, over summer, they just die back completely. Often, if your climate and where you live and it's very hot, it used to be recommended that you would put them on their side, let them dry out. And then when, as soon as they're starting to shoot in autumn, and they'll come back again but what we find is that they dehydrate too much particularly in the western part of the country they'll dehydrate too much so what we recommend now is if you've got them in the top of a pot you've got a pot plant that gets watered it doesn't have to be too regularly but often and you find there's a little bit of moisture around the camellia bulb tends to come back easily so you'll find they'll die back totally i've actually got mine planted in the top of some large terracotta pots where i've got weeping maples that are on the edge of a shaded spot and then they just come back beautifully and then die back down completely but you can have bedding cyclamens you can have potted cyclamens and they always look gorgeous as a mass of flowers and then once you repot them plant three or four bulbs in one pot and they'll just absolutely thrive so fantastic winter color go for it don't be scared of cyclamens because they're super easy to grow to Fremantle, i have tomato worms in my raised garden bed what can i do to stop them when you say tomato worms are they curl grubs if they're curl grubs actually one of the ways to do it is just to pick them out and you'll find if you can just pluck them off and feed them to the magpies that will stop them but when you say tomato worms i'm thinking if it's nematodes and you're thinking that you might have nematodes in your garden and particularly in sandy soil plant a crop of mustard or a brassica crop so you'll find when a strong say cabbage or a broccoli crop and dig that in as a green manure crop or after you've harvested it all dig it in mustard's also very good and used a lot to repel nematodes naturally rather than having to resort to anything else so nematode, nematodes in the soil render the the crop pretty unsuitable it gets stunted the root system doesn't work effectively and you end up with problems so if you can have healthy soil also the use of seaweed extract and organic matter and soil improver makes an absolute huge difference to the health of a garden and the garden can actually cope with a few nematodes or a plant can cope with a few nematodes if it's not stressed Hopefully that answers your question, Rachel. We're going to Mittagong in New South Wales via the Garden Express Facebook. I'm sure Dave will be happy to hear that when we talk to him. Greg, I want to buy a clear or white coloured greenhouse for my seedlings in winter. As I understand, this will keep my plants warmer in winter. Will it do the same as the green coloured type in summer? Actually, interesting. What we have to do is if it's, if it's clear, just be careful that it's not too hot. Uh, depending where you live um, the white one just lets out just if you're in a warmer part part of the country it just blocks out a little bit of that spectrum of light so it keeps the plants a little bit more protected so yes it'll keep that warmth in no problem at all and you need that and but many glass houses across the country in the old days or the poly sheeting they actually whitewashed and that what that does is means that it just blocks out that bright light that becomes a problem so on my recommendation maybe we'll talk to um, David but my recommendation is just get a white colored greenhouse particularly if you live in an area where there's high light on Saturdays I hope that our helps I'm actually dreaming for a glass house as a greenhouse as well and um, particularly when it's wet go in there and it's nice and warm but plants just absolutely love it get a few head start on a few plants seed germinating and also keeping those plants through winter looking fantastic that's every gardener's dream i think now 
every gardener i'm hoping watched the garden gurus our seasons finale this weekend but on saturday's seasons finale bonnie headed into garden express to check out their fantastic operation let's take a look before we talk to david with decades of experience Garden Express has been producing and shipping plants to our gardens for close to 70 years and 20 years online. So let's find out how all this magic happens. It all begins with placing the order online. Garden Express has one of the most extensive ranges of perennials from shrubs to trees, potted plants, and of course, my favorites, bulbs and edible plants. Once the order has been made, all you have to do is sit back and relax. Got some hot tips. You can be assured that when you mail order plants, you see where they come from. It's always good, I think, to know where they come from, the operation, the love and the passion that goes into every plant. And I think there is a lot of love and passion that goes into every plant produced in Australia. But someone who's absolutely passionate about plants, we talk to him regularly. I look forward to it very much on our Monday chat is David Van Berkel, who's part of, well, he is the man behind Gardens Express. Hi, David. Hi, Sue. How are you going? Yeah, very well. Now, I'm pretty excited because it's raining. It feels like winter today. That's the first day we've had that feels like winter. So it does mean that I want to get some roses. Um, leaves have dropped off the roses. They're looking dormant. Now it means like, oh, I might have to plant some more in my garden. It's time. It's definitely time. Although mm. our leaves have fallen off a long time before yours, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it certainly does. And we did uh, preempt the rose season a little bit earlier on. And you were saying a few weeks ago, you were saying Garden Express has almost a staged release of roses. They come at different times depending what's available. And I wanted to feature roses today because it really is probably what many um, bare-rooted uh, mail-order businesses were built on in the long, like, many years ago. Many years ago, yeah, absolutely. You know, dormant roses was the only way they sold roses before, you know, probably in the early 70s, the, the idea of the, you know, pot plants became really big and um, they went from tinware to plastic pots and all the rest of it. So, yeah, definitely dormant roses were, were a massive staple for garden centres, uh, for mail order companies, of course, and, and many, many rose growers, particularly throughout Adelaide. Yeah, so have you been selling roses for how many years? Can we let that secret out, David? <laughs> yeah. Since I was a baby, basically. It's uh, one of those jobs that comes around every um, every May. We get the first of the roses and, and we've been bagging roses forever. Uh, and back in the day, we even did some bagging for a big company called Kmart. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? The market has changed. Rose market has changed a lot, particularly it used to be the place to go to get the roses. The the new varieties were at the big companies that you saw, but now we've got a lot more niche market. You've got more control. Is that the right way of, of what you can give out and when? Yeah, I, I guess so. I guess the, um, the way the process happens, there's different breeders around the world and then there's different growers associated with those breeders. And and so, yeah, the, the avenues to market have changed a lot. And I guess uh, for, for us guys uh, on the internet or, or particularly the, the traditional mail order, we have some really good access to those varieties, particularly due to the low numbers that initially come through on trial roses or, or new, new roses. There typically might only be a thousand available for the country. Um, and so you can't really put that through a, a big box retailer. It wouldn't wouldn't be many in each store, so to speak. So, um, yeah, we're pretty lucky. We work pretty hard to find those new things to bring to customers as well. That's what I wanted to ask you. I mean, you must get like we do. We're at the next step. But we get all these catalogues and thinking, how do I choose what's going to suit? Because rose breeding is a big business around the world. Absolutely. And, and I guess over time, there's been a little bit more emphasis put on climate and, uh, and disease resistance as well, which happens in a lot of breeding programs. You know, what can we deliver best for? Uh, is it for the gardener? Is it for the cut flower industry? Uh, as happens with, um, with vegetables and produce for, for uh, people to eat as well. 
So, um, so with roses, you know, there's been some really good um, advancements in roses for warm climates to get rid of the black spot and the powdery mildew. Uh, but also some of those really delicious traditional roses, um, the David Austin varieties, of course, uh, really, really beautiful roses and a little bit hard to get as well. Yeah, and is there a is there a trend that we're looking, you know, I picked up, you mentioned disease resistance, heat tolerance. Was there a trend back to perfume or has it always been there, David? I think it's always been there, you know. I guess the, there's a thing about the sexy colours, particularly by colours, you know, and I had a discussion with uh, with the group of the, the Dahlia Society, National Dahlia Society, and they won't show by colours on their benches uh, because they're imperfect. But as home gardeners, we love, you know, that trend of, of um, fashionable colours or, or by colours just really are something quite different. So... There was a bit of a trend away from the perfume, but now I do believe it's back for sure. Oh, I look forward to that. So can you give us a few tips? I know this is a question without notice, so I don't expect you to go, yeah, I can think of it straight away. But are there, say, a top five that um, of of roses that, that you love personally, that are your favourite, that you would put in your garden? Oh, goodness me. Uh, I have about a <laughs> hundred like roses plan. in my garden, so that is putting me on the spot a bit. Look, I suppose the most popular five would be any any of the icebergs. Obviously, the white iceberg. It flowers for the longest. It delivers the most uh, blooms per per rose bush. So it's one of the biggest favourites, of course. Just Joey, beautiful, beautiful apricot with a really beautiful scent. Um, some of the reds, Mister Lincoln. Is probably the top one, or Papa Mayon, uh, a French variety, uh, very very popular. Um, Peace still rates up there. It it's been superseded by a few better by colours, but Peace is just one of those fantastic roses. Celebrated fifty years, I think, about five six years ago. You know, interesting you say Peace because I, I was struck by Peace, the book that was written called Spirit of Peace and how the, the Peace Rose came to came to into our gardens. It's just an incredible story about the passion around plant breeding. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And I think the, the, the book came out that the, a new rose, the Spirit of Peace, which was a, yeah. a, a more, um, more exciting sport, I suppose. Uh, and, and that's the story of, say, uh, Burgundy Iceberg, you know, just a sport of iceberg. And then off that was Blushing Pink Iceberg, um, all proven to be really beautiful roses in their own right. And interesting, you mentioned Blushing, uh, sorry, Burgundy Iceberg, because as a garden plant, it is stunning. We've, I drive past a hedge of a Burgundy Iceberg every day and I just love it. Um it, it is a delicious colour. It really is. There's very few like it that have that really rich, uh, you know, burgundy flavour. You, you sort of, once you get into purples, you really do struggle to, to get that consistency of flower. Um, some of the best rows, like I love sentimental. It's one of my favourites. I can never seem to grow a, a fantastically big bush, but the blooms <laughs> are just exquisite. So um, breeding creates some really interesting results. You know, I often say to people, the, um, the prettiest things are probably not the easiest to grow uh, because that, that diversity or those, um, those one-offs in nature that come up, um, you know, they do present some other issues. Yeah, they certainly do. Now, Garden Express has their um, bulb, sorry, roses out, um, the varieties of roses we head to your website. Uh, all of them available, readily available at the moment, David? Yeah, we've, we've still got a good list. We've, uh, we, as I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we've got some, some new varieties turning up uh, from the paddocks every couple of weeks. We've got our patios and standards coming through uh, probably around the second week of June. Uh, and that's why it's been nice this year to be able to break up the delivery of the roses with, um, with what's available. If we held them all until the middle of June, people would be a little bit too keen and eager. So you can maybe plant a few this week, plant a few in, a, in another month's time. And now that you mentioned, I just want to quickly mention patio roses because they're another underrated um, group of roses. They are fantastic for pots. They really do flower. You chop them back quickly. They look a little bit awful for a bit when you chop them back. Well, I don't mind that look, but they they come back so beautifully so quickly. Yeah, and, and I guess for people who maybe haven't heard of that term or, or misinterpret that term, it's not just a rose for your patio. It's a rose that's budded onto a, a two-foot stem. 
So it gives you a little bit of clear uh, clearance from your pot, makes it great for underplanting with some petunias or some of those other seedlings. Uh, and then a standard rose is, is traditionally onto a three to up to four foot stem before the bud. So that really brings it up nicely in the garden. Then of course, a weeper is a five to six foot stem, a traditionally a, a rambling or climbing rose that hangs down. Yeah, quite beautiful as well. Garden Express, how do we get hold of the roses? Hopefully we've inspired a few to plant some rock. Wow. Every year I do it. I love planting them. I do curse it when I have to prune them, David, I must say, but um, it's worth it. Where do we head? Uh, www.gardenexpress.com.au Ah, oh, fantastic. David, thanks very much for your time again. Uh, just a few of those favourite roses of yours i know you've got them coming up fantastic operation garden express has delivering australia's gardens through the mail and make a huge difference support works really well and hopefully this is my last time for a few weeks so hopefully i catch up with you soon yeah absolutely we've got plenty coming up we've got fuchsias gladiolis we're starting to harvest our dahlias hippie astrums there's an enormous range to uh to come over the next three to five months so we look forward to speaking to you soon see you. <laughs> doesn't take long and the years come around again thanks david i know he'll be out to plant some roses i'm sure he's got hundreds in his garden i'm sure every year you get even if you grow plants you're still absolutely passionate about it and as he said he's been growing those plants for since he was a baby how has it changed i remember definitely they used to be bare rooted the plants were then planted in tin pots they were then um, put into terracotta pots as well and then of course then modern horticulture has made it easy to cut plants around the country so well done to garden express and their team for getting those plants to your backyard now i'm going to talk to you about a few plants looking absolutely amazing in my garden and i wanted to just kick off well i started with one and now i say plant of the week and i started with one and now i've just got way too many so let's go through it let's talk about it now this one is looking just started to come into flower are the camelosiums so the gerotin waxes and these plants are particularly west australian but do grow particularly beautiful all around the country this is purple pride purple pride starts off as a lighter color and it will be in full flower for three or four months and then as it flowers or finishes flowering as the flowers fade they will they don't fade lighter they actually fade darker and you end up with this beautiful purple flower trick to growing these is to chop them off and then they shoot away again i know trevor on the garden gurus have featured wax growers and some of the newer varieties this is an old-fashioned variety one of the toughest hardiest ones you can put in your garden and they do particularly well the other thing that i wanted to feature today was many citrus growers have been been answering people's gardening questions on talkback radio for 25 years and many citrus people ring up and say oh my citrus has set this fruit out and it's not looking like it should i wanted to show you what rootstock actually looks like and maybe what's happened in the difference of a rootstock so this is a kumquat nagami this is so beautiful and one of the little tips if you crunch the leaves of a citrus you don't know what it is if you crunch the leaves and smell it you'll find it usually represents what plant it is so if it's a lemon tree you'll know it'll smell like lemon if it's an orange the leaves smell like orange so this kumquat nagami i have got a part of the plant growing which is this is the rootstock that's been allowed to shoot away so very different this fruit doesn't come to anything so always if you see anything that's got rough skin like this cut it out because what that will do is take over your citrus trees and you end up with sort of problem so that's a fruit when it's green then what it might look what it looks like when it's actually it looks like a lemon doesn't it so if it starts off green and it's very lumpy like that if you open this up it's thick skin very coarse not a lot of juice and you think oh it's a lemon tree the plants changed to a lemon tree but that's rootstock as well so you think you've got that sorted and you think right i know exactly what rootstock looks like then you might come across a rootstock like this now this rootstock is another citron rootstock and when you look at the leaf you end up the leaf is very different on the plant so keep an eye out for that if it's not what you bought or what you thought it might look like 
This is actually the rootstock of a native citrus tree that's been harvested. So the native citrus is a very small leaf. And this is what they've used for rootstock. And the tell, telltale of this as rootstock are these thorns. It's a pretty good indicator that it's rootstock taking over. So then we move to our finger lime. And see, you've got so much, so many problems in my garden as well. So finger lime root plant actually looks like that and it should look like that. So there's even still got a few little thorns, a few small leaves, and we featured a finger lime a few weeks ago if you wanted to talk about those. What the rootstock looks like is this really coarse, harsh, harsh, prickly plant that the leaves are beautiful autumn colour but drops their leaves in winter. So any of those, if you've got that, you've got something that looks like that or you've got this on your citrus trees, it may be rootstock. If it's not exactly what you've got on your citrus trees, you might have to cut it out or take it to your local garden centre and see if they can identify it for you because what it does tends to take over your citrus trees. Hope that helps. It's actually, ah, see, it's prickly. Also, um, what, it, what it actually does is takes over the tree and you'll lose the, the bit you actually want to grow the citrus tree for. So we'll head, hopefully that helps identify what can be rootstock. And you just cut it out as, as you'll see where it's been grafted and you just need to really cut close and almost gouge out the rootstock stems because otherwise they'll keep shooting away and keep causing a problem on your citrus tree. I'm going to get rid of that. That's so prickly. Let's head to our, our garden questions and answers don't forget that you've got a chance to win some seeds if we answer your question and we'll put the comments we'll put the winners on our comment section stay tuned for that margot how do i get rid of mealybugs mealybugs are actually a bit tricky to get rid of they, they hang around the plant's roots as well if there's a few on the top of the leaf you can nab it with methylated spirits but if you've got them if you dig around the base of the plant you've got them and you can see a few insects around the base dunking the whole plant pot and all with natra soap is what we can control mealybugs for they're actually a little bit tricky to control and you've just got to keep at it not not a one-term fix with mealybug it's actually a long-term fix to get rid of those to broken hill for good Good evening, good afternoon, I should say, Pam. I've been given a small quince tree because of lack of available ground. I've put it in a half wine barrel. Can you give me advice on how to care for it, please? Controlled release fertilizer, good quality potting mix, full sun and water in summer. That's really all you need with a quince tree. They are incredibly hardy. Beautiful small tree and one that will cope beautifully in a wine barrel, Pam. Enjoy it. To Leah, who's sent a message via the Garden Guru Facebook page, I've heard that since we don't get the chill factor that other countries get, that it's good to put ice cubes on things like peonies to give them extra chill time. What other plants could this work on? Yeah, I've heard people do it and some people swear by it. Some people don't say it doesn't make a difference. But if you can get onto it, absolutely go for it and see how you go. Peonies will grow without, particularly in Melbourne, without having to worry about ice blocks. But it works really well with cherries. If you're growing cherries, tree peonies, it will, there's um, some bulbs need the chill factor as well. So give it, a, give it a go. There's a few things that need the cold. English lilac is another one that you'll be able to get the cold and get them to come up. But mm, it's a lot of work. And then I'd be thinking, try to grow the plants that cope beautifully in your climate and you don't have to worry and still enjoy them. So there are peonies and I know Garden Express um, will be able to help you with the varieties that are well suited to your climate, particularly in Melbourne. To Adelaide via Garden Express Facebook, something is eating Leone. Hello, something is eating my leaves of my collie and broccoli in a high raised bed. I've sprayed with Confidor, but no change. Any ideas, please? If it's eating them, as they've got little holes in them it could be a problem called diamondback moth now the diamondback moth is a little um, little larvae that's actually it's not the adult that causes the problem it's the larvae that causes the problem and one of the controls you can use for that is either dipel or success and particularly with the cauliflowers and broccoli i would say mostly that's what's causing the problem there's quite a few giant crickets around also so out at night with a torch might be the best way to go leone to bundenberg 
Bev and Keith, hello. When is the best time for growing root vegetables and salad vegetables? Well, it actually depends, but root it depends what you're planning to grow. But root vegetables do really well in winter. There's something intensive. The cool weather intensifies the flavour. You'll have a better chance growing parsnips and swedes and turnips and carrots through the winter rather than through the summer. Salad veggies, you can grow repeat harvest lettuce at the moment, do absolutely brilliantly, but capsicums for salads, you'll find beans for salads, and you'll find the the repeat harvest lettuce will actually do really well in spring. If you tend to get bitter leaves in summer, it's because the variety is stressed. So the plants need to be grown, particularly repeat har harvest lettuce leaves, need to be grown quick, and quick turnaround harvested quickly. English spinach is a winter crop and also rocket will do better. Much stronger flavor in the spring and as the weather warms up, grows really fast at this time of the year and you can harvest it well. What is a good fertilizer from for a magnolia? That's Greg. So not sure where Greg is, but if he's growing magnolia, we talked controlled release fertilizer, Greg. So when we're talking osmocote for camellias and azaleas, you can use that. Any citrus fertilizer, you can use that. Any complete flower and fruit fertilizer as well for a magnolia. Anything that is for flowering, delivers the nutrients for flowering, you can use. Now, it's probably no different if it's growing in a pot or in the ground, but always, you can always guarantee you won't burn anything if you use controlled release fertilizer on a plant in a pot. And you'll find that sometimes, depending what you use in a, in a pot, if it's a quick release one, that can cause problems, but always recommend using controlled release fertilizer in the pot. Makes a big difference and also takes the guesswork out of feeding plants. Also from, well, not sure that the area where we're heading to Perth now, my garden has been inundated with grasshoppers who have munched many of my plants, including citrus and apple trees. Any suggestions? That's from Colette. I know, Colette, there are so many in WA. I don't know where they've come from. They just appeared and you see a few nymphs around as well. So there's a giant one. You'll see lots of them and they take huge munches out of plants and they've been a problem for the last six months and the baby nymphs are causing a problem as well so if you look closely you'll see it on a few rose leaves also you'll find that one of the best things to use is eco neem or neem oil now it's registered for it and it won't affect the adults at the moment but it interferes with their reprodu reproduction system and so interfere with their breeding cycle over a period of time and so if you can get the neem oil onto them, they'll still hop around and you'll think, ah, these are meant to die. They'll still hop around. But the next next lot will be knocked around. So you reduce the population also. There are products around with called cricket and grasshopper bait. You can use those, but be very careful if you've got animals around your garden. You don't want a brand bait that they're attracted to also. That's why eco neem or neem oil is one of the most effective controls for grasshoppers at this time of the year. To Jacinta, what are the best Aussie plant varieties for a long retaining walls? Not sure what area you live in, but a few a few that you can plant that will do really well. Well, my goodness, grevilleas as a plant genus or a group of plants, there are many different species of grevilleas that will also be able to retain, but also screen and do really well. And also depending if you wanted them to hang down, they'll cascade down. For native plants, you can plant some of the scavola varieties if you wanted plants to hang down and cascade over your retaining wall. If you wanted to put some of the native native rosemary, so the wistringers do brilliantly and they'll cascade down, but also they'll grow up depending up to a metre and a half species. So if you've got a really hot, dry spot, head to your local garden centre, Jacinta, and just have a look at the area, maybe take a few photos head to your local native specialist and they'll be help, help you with some species that do really well. But if it's to cascade down, a couple of the ground covering grevilleas are absolutely brilliant. Check those out because I'm sure you'll love them in your garden. And the honey eaters and the birds will love them also. To Melbourne, Leah, is there a dwarf mandarin tree that will do well in a large pot that's seedless? Yes, there are many. Uh, if you can go for some of the mandarins that yeah there are seedless varieties of mandarins but also chase one up that's on a dwarfing rootstock and you'll find they'll grow brilliantly in a pot even if they're not grown on dwarfing rootstock mandarins are by their very nature 
the seedless varieties are quite small plants anyway. So when I say a large pot, you're looking at a plant pot, so half a wine barrel, you'll be able to easily grow a mandarin in that uh, size container and they'll do brilliantly. To Australind, head south of Perth, the ends of my avocado leaves are going brown. Can you tell me why? To Dennis, or Denise, I should say. Denise, that can happen for a few reasons. Avocados are quite heavy, you know, they need quite a bit of water, but also their older leaves will burn around the edges. So if they're in a particularly windy spot, there's salt damage, something like that can cause a problem on the older leaves until the new growth comes out. So it depends if it's the older leaves that are causing a problem or the newer leaves. Just check down the stem of your avocado as well because you'll see areas where it might have gone black. That's an indicator of sunburn. So if there's not enough foliage over the plant and it's protecting the plant, we've had a particularly hot day, the damage will show up a few months down the track. So burning around the edges of the leaves is, is almost a process of elimination, working out what's causing that. But if the new growth is fine, looking healthy, the older leaves will be burning and that's fairly normal for an avocado tree growing in in our West Australian climate for it to burn around the edges of the leaves. And if it's in a pot, they're going black, that's a different story. It could be a symptom of overwatering. So depending on the situation they're in, chase it up, and see how they go. To Melbourne, hi Leanne, hopes your garden's looking gorgeous. I have a wisteria that's a little out of control. Should I cut all the skinny branches off and just leave the main ones? The leaves are dropping now. It's actually interesting with wisteria is prune it it's okay you can prune prune back the skinny ones and you might prune back some of the flowering some of the flowering wood but if it's really fine and it's had a really good autumn growth it's not going to cause a problem with your flowering this season but next spring after it's finished flowering and it's sent out its new growth growth about five weeks after it's sent out its new growth and then that new growth's hardened off that's when you prune it that new growth's pruned back to five or seven buds and then next autumn, when it shoots away again, because it always has a little bit of a secondary growth, that's when you give it another light prune. And then you're ready for it to flower. The harder wisteria's are growing, the more they're neglected. Actually, the better they flower, more sun they have also. And yeah, they tend to grow a little bit out of control. But do you think, I think, Leanne, they're absolutely worth that beautiful spring perfume when they're in full flower. It's just a delight to have. So persevere with it. To Canberra, I have a diamonds in the dark crepe myrtle which has a white substance on the leaves. Should I just leave it? It's losing its leaves. Can I plant in the garden now and should I add it to the garden compost? And should I add garden compost? Yeah, that white substance on the leaves is a problem that most crepe myrtles get. Some of them are resistant to it and diamonds in the dark supposed to be resistant to it and that's a problem called powdery mildew. Yeah, look, not a lot we can do about it now. You can give them a winter cover spray if you want to, but as it drops its leaves, it's environmental. There's a little bit of humidity this time of the year. The plant's slowing its growth rate down. They do tend to get a little bit of, little bit of um, powdery mildew. And if it's in a bit of a shady position, there'll be more powdery mildew on the leaves than what it would be if it's out in the open. So, yep, you can plant it in the garden now. You won't see lots of growth, but you'll definitely see an established plant coming into spring as once it's getting established at the moment. Yes, definitely add garden compost. And depending where you are in Canberra, where the soil is quite heavy, some of it's sandy, I think, from memory. But if you can add garden compost, add some blood and bone as well, definitely. It's like planting a bare-rooted tree. The secret's in the soil preparation for the following spring. That makes a big difference. And gardening at this time of the year is all about soil, all about preparing the soil and enjoying it and getting out there and digging whatever you plant at this time of the year. If there's one tip you can take back at this time of the year is improve the soil. Put a lot of your effort into improving the soil and that makes your life as a gardener so much easier. Uh, that tip helps every plant that's going into the ground this week or this weekend as well. Well, that's it. That's it for today's episode of the Garden Gurus Live. Thanks so much for joining us. Trevor will be back next week 
So next Monday, mark it. Trev's back, back in town. He's out and about. I'm sure he's got lots of tales of where he's been and what he's doing. Seen some gorgeous parts of the country and also further. He's been overseas as well. So further afield, um, I'm sure he'll share that with you. We'll be back. Well, Trev will be back next Monday at 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So for WA viewers, that's 10 o'clock. Mark, set an alarm now so you can remember. We hope you enjoyed this season of The Garden Gurus. Remember, you can always jump onto the website and catch up on previous episodes. If you're missing out on your Garden Gurus fix, the stories are at thegardengurus.tv or our YouTube channel, thegardengurus.tv. You can listen back today if there was something that you've missed. Lots of information on camellias if you want to know how to care for those, if you'd like to find out some of David Van Berkel's favourite roses. You can listen back today on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Audible as you can on any previous episodes of today's live stream. And we'll see you again. Don't forget, Trev will join you next Monday at 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. In the meantime, enjoy your garden. Visit the Garden Guru's online store and browse through a collection of high-quality, German-made wolf garden tools. You'll also find a range of books with information to help create and maintain a beautiful garden. You can also access the online store on the Garden Guru's Facebook page 